Okay, uh, welcome back folks to week three of HI237. This is the last of our introductory lectures, and today we are examining the heroic ideal, uh, the warrior ethos of the Viking Age. I think this is the last piece we need to fill in our look at the Scandinavian uh, side of things to get things rolling with the course. Uh, after we do that, we're going to have a bit of a discussion of uh, Viking ships. Okay. Sorry for the slight uh, problem with the image there. I'm not sure what happened. Anyways, if we're going to take a look at the ideal warrior of the Viking Age, we need to acknowledge a few things about Scandinavian society first. The concept of living a heroic life was a significant one. We see it in many types of Scandinavian literature and the themes that it emphasizes. Uh, martial prowess, courage... Uh, these are all key aspects of the life that you should want to leave, live. And in the end, if you can't have a heroic life, you can at least manage a heroic death. Uh, but as we've sort of figured that out by looking at the Havamal, and that's an aspirational ideal. It's not something that everybody is going to be able to achieve. And it only really applies to certain classes of society. Uh, it's there, however, and much like the uh, Code of Chivalry, in the later Middle Ages, the heroic code of the, the Scandinavians is wrapped up in group identity. And here we might mention the concept of the comitatus, or the war band. Uh, the Latin descriptor comes from Tacitus, uh, who wrote the Germania in the first century AD. He was writing about the bonds between Germanic warriors and their chosen leaders, about how you don't survive your leader, you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to leave the battlefield before them. That was dishonorable. Uh, there are problems with using the Germania as a source. Uh, like most ethnographic, most ethnographic works, it says more about the Romans than it does about the ancient Germans. And there certainly is a significant uh, gulf between the Germans of Tacitus' time, who we really even shouldn't be calling Germans, and the Scandinavians of the Viking Age. And yet, you know, we, we do have this social institution uh, the war band. It's a little bit more nebulous than Tacitus likes to paint it, but it's there. Now, the thing to remember, and the thing that we do know was very true about uh, relationships between warriors, is that they needed to be reciprocal, and this is actually reflected uh, in literature as well. The warrior gives, but so does the Lord. Uh, those of you who've read Beowulf will remember the king being referred to as the gold giver. The warrior who serves well is rewarded as part of that service and respects his leader for rewarding him. Uh, there is a common language when um, warriors and their lords are praised for behaving well in this relationship. Now, you are going to read uh, an interesting um, little set of mini excerpts uh, which are entitled the accomplishments of a viking warrior in your reader and you should ask yourself uh, what are the characteristics of a perfect scandinavian warrior are they all physical if they're not all physical why um, what's valued most highly or less highly and do these descriptions of perfect warriors have any discussion of flaws now, these warrior virtues can take on a much more unusual shape uh, in the eyes of their enemies. So this is an excerpt from William of Malmesbury's Chronicle. He's talking about the Battle of Stamford Bridge, which was a battle between the English and uh, the Northmen under King Harald Hadrada. So the English got the upper hand and put the Norwegians to flight. Yet, and perhaps posterity will find this hard to believe, a victory by so many men of quality was to, such quality was delayed for a long time by a single Norseman. This man stood at the entrance to the bridge and accounted for several of our force, stopping the rest from getting across. Called upon to give himself up so that a man of such valor could experience the generous clemency of the English, he laughed at those who offered it, and screwing up his face, taunted them with being men so feeble-hearted that they could not stand up to a solitary man. Nobody came nearer to him, for they thought it rash to get at close quarters with someone who had desperately thrown aside all means of saving himself. One of the king's followers hurled an iron spear at him from a distance. 
It struck him through as he was arrogantly making preliminary flourishes and was taking inadequate care of his safety, and he yielded victory to the English. So Willem F. Malmesbury is not particularly impressed by this guy. He's like, oh yeah, really valorous, really valorous and really stupid. Uh, but this would have been very much in line with how uh, Scandinavian would have been expected to behave, right? If you are uh, going to stand up on the battlefield, defend your ground, you're going to do that. You're not necessarily um, going to do it in the wisest way possible. And certainly there are other cases where we see Scandinavians making odd choices uh, about such things. So we are, you're also going to be doing a, f a couple of other readings. Um, one on berserkers. Do you, when you read this, ask yourself, how do you reconcile the idea of the berserker with the uh, positive ideal of the Scandinavian warrior? Or do you at all? And specifically with this story, Egil and his friends take a very negative view of Liot, the, deser the berserker. And I would like you to think about why that is. And you have two small excerpts on women, uh, specifically warrior women or female warrior beings. Take a look at both of them and compare them and ask yourself, you know, what do they tell us about how Scandinavian society saw women who stepped outside traditional gender roles? Okay, so that's the bit about the ideal warrior. And yeah, most of this is going to be discussion of readings in class. I just wanted to give you some background. All right, ships. Uh, the historian F. Donald Logan makes the excellent point. There was no such thing as the Viking ship. There were, in fact, many kinds of Viking ships. Now, Scandinavians had an edge when it came to developing their shipbuilding technology. Uh, water, as we discussed uh, last week, was the best means of transportation given the terrain of the region. The sea is all around them, not just all around them, but right next to them. I mean, the interior waters, large lakes, uh, fjords, rivers are hugely significant. Uh, their culture formed with this maritime orientation firmly in place. Now, the fjords in particular would have allowed for relatively safe experimentation. They're very deep, so they mimic ocean conditions, but they're also very narrow, so you're never very far away from land if the ship comes apart. So Scandinavia, in a way, could be called a shipbuilder's laboratory. So their shipbuilding technology uh, developed much more quickly than many other Western European societies. Their ships were lighter, faster, and more effective. And it was uh, also part of their culture in a different way, perhaps because they were never Romanized. They kept a certain Bronze Age tradition. Uh, the ship is a religious symbol, not just a secular object. So by this I mean ship burials were quite common. Now, this does suggest that ships were refined for aesthetic as well as practical reasons. They were status symbols. They weren't just functional tools. The earliest surviving, well, surviving, quote-unquote, it's, it's in pieces. Uh, the earliest ship we have uh, evidence for from Scandinavia is known as the Yort Spring Boat from southwest Denmark. And it basically is a war canoe. It's 19 meters long, 2 meters wide. The bottom is a hollowed out tree trunk that's been expanded. The sides are formed by planks. It's an example of what we call clinker construction. So it's actually the earliest example, as I said. Uh, it means that the seams between the planks overlap and the gaps are closed by softer material usually tar, to make the hull waterproof. Uh, the Yort Spring boat was rowed, we believe, by 24 paddles, and it was sunk in a lake around uh, 350 BC with the equipment of defeated warriors, likely as a sacrifice. Now, there are similar boats found from the 4th century AD at Nidum. They are clinker-built, but their ribs are fastened by iron rivets. Uh, there's oak and pine tree, pine wood used and the paddles are replaced by oars. So this makes them much bigger. We unfortunately have minimal evidence for the development of technology between these two examples. Um, possibly, you know, they, it's hard to say what the intervening steps were. Um, we don't know, for instance, uh, when they started using sails. Uh, t textiles don't tend to survive very well. 
And our, our first actual Viking Age example is the Osberg ship from 820 or thereabouts. It is uh, quite long, uh, 21 f meters, uh, 5 broad. Uh, it's an impressive ship. The burial chamber was hung with tapestries and it contained two female bodies, one older, one younger, and many grave goods. Now, the dendrochronology suggests that it was in use for about 10 to 15 years before it was buried with these two women. So it may have been a functional ship that was turned into a ceremonial ship. Now, we see massive and rapid improvements over the course of the 9th century uh, to things like mast, shape, and so forth. And this we see in the uh, Gokstad ship in particular. It's another burial ship dated towards the end of the century. Now, these new sailing ships are different. They're broader and deeper. The uh, shape of the hull has changed. The bottom is now made of several pieces. The new ships aren't as fast, uh, but they're a lot more stable. Uh, I'm skipping over a lot of technical vocabulary here uh, because it's not really necessary. You just need to know the basic nature of the change. Uh, we don't have surviving sails still, but we do have picture stones that de depict ships uh, using what looks like uh, cross-hatched patterns, possibly ropes and uh, rigging. And literary evidence claims that the sails were often colorful and striped. That's part of the intimidation uh, factor. Now, the Gogstad ship is considerably deeper than the Osberg ship. Uh, it was apparently made for ocean voyages, whereas warships are often long and slender. They're built for speed. You have different needs, right? As a Scandinavian who requires ships. Are you going to fight your neighbors or are you just exploring? Uh, the shallow draft of uh, warships in particular allowed them not just to come close to land, but also to sail up rivers and be portaged easily inland. Well, what does this mean? It means it sucked to be Frankish. Uh, they had so many handy rivers with their major cities on them. Cargo ships also emerged. They would have larger hulls, uh, more oars. Uh, that became even more important, of course, when the Vikings started to expand into the North Atlantic. All right, I'm going to give you a little bit of fun vocabulary just for the sake of it. So some ship types worth mentioning. Uh, the NAR, which is the term used for ships that made Atlantic voyages and could carry cargo. And our examples for this are, you know, the best ones are amongst the Skoldelev ships, which were sunken in a fjord to block a channel in the 11th century. Uh, there were five of them uh, of different types. The NAR shows us that ship dimensions could change dramatically. Uh, it could carry significant amounts of cargo, and it was very seaworthy. Okay, the Drakkar is the dragon ship with a carved dragon's head on its prow. This is not a technical term. We find it used only in poetry. It may have originally been the name of a single particular ship. Uh, I'm thinking about Olaf Tryggvason's uh, ship, the Long Serpent. Skeed is much more common as, as a term. It means that which cuts through water, and this refers to warships with 30 rowing benches. Snekya, also common, uh, translates as thin and projecting. And these are small warships that could easily be beached or carried across a portage. Uh, Viking ships often had two small docks, decks at bow and stern. And between them, they could tent uh, the main deck with an awning whenever the ship was at anchor or in harbor. And this gave the crew some protection against the weather. Uh, we have a saga reference to ships covered with black tents and light shining out from inside them. Now, the ship's sh uh, crew's shields could be hung along the side of the ship. This was usually just for display, we think. Um, although we do have sagas telling us that these ships were displayed like this uh, when they were heading into battle. Now, if you look at our existing ships, a couple of them really you couldn't have done that with. Um, if you did that with a Gokstad ship, it would have covered the ore port ports. You could have done that on the Osberg ship. So it depended on the ship, almost certainly. And I just wanted to close with an up-close uh, look at the Osberg ship's original prow, which is basically a perfect little dragon, I would argue. 
All right, uh, that will do. And uh, we will be back uh, within a few days with more lectures. But otherwise, guys, I will uh, see you at the Zoom session.